long ago, before lines were drawn in the sands of Arab lands, there was a doctor. He was a very fine doctor. It was said that he had studied in Baghdad, Damascus, and Isfahan. He was greatly admired in the town where he lived. He was, in fact, the only real doctor in the town where he lived. He walked the streets with his head held high, and the people ran to greet him. They kissed his hands, so grateful to him for having cured them of all their various horrible maladies. And the doctor had grown rich, selling medicines to cure them of their various horrible maladies, which he prepared in his apothecary. But nobody knew what was in the medicines, and if anybody asked, the doctor would never tell them. He lived in a fine house, and it had an extensive library full of medical books, it was told. Though no one had ever seen the library, because the doctor always kept it under lock and key. Not even the servants could enter. Now, there were many young people in the town who longed to become a doctor. But when they went to the doctor to ask if they could learn from him, he just sent them away. And they went away dejected, thinking it was because they weren't good enough. The truth is, the truth is, the doctor was afraid. He loved the feeling of power and importance his position gave him as the only doctor in the town. And he was afraid that he would lose that if a rival came his way. Now in the town, there was a young man, and he was also afraid, but he was afraid about what was going to happen when the doctor died. Who would there be to take over the practice, to heal the people, all the suffering there would be if the doctor died before passing on his knowledge? The young man met, spent many sleepless nights worrying about this. And one day, he came up with a plan. It was brilliant. The plan was this. He went and asked his mum. It was brilliant. And he went to his mother and he asked her to go to the doctor and he told her what to say. So the woman went to the doctor and she said, Oh, doctor, take pity on a poor widowed mother. I have a son. He cannot speak. He cannot hear. He cannot read and write and he's not very bright, but... But he works very hard and he's good with his hands. Could you give him a place of work? I don't know what to do with him. Now, when the doctor heard this, he was delighted. You see, he had long been in need of a helper, but he had been afraid to give the work to anyone in case someone began to learn from him. But now he was a young man who couldn't hear, could speak, couldn't read or write. What possible threat could he be? And so he said to the woman, have your son sent to work with me immediately. And so the young man began to work as the doctor's helper. And he worked very hard, fetching and carrying, running errands. He spent hours grinding the medicinal herbs in a pestle and mortar and sweeping the apothecary floor. But all the time, that he was grinding the medicinal herbs. He was watching the doctor. And all the time that he was sweeping the floor, he was listening, listening to the doctor who muttered to himself as he worked. Three drops of opium in rose oil and root of solanum. Even though the doctor believed that this helper couldn't read, he never let him enter the library. But one day, the 
helper saw the doctor hiding the key in a secret hiding place. And so, that night, he took a candle, he tiptoed through the house. He took the key from its secret hiding place. He went to the library door, put the key in the lock, turned it, the door open. A cavernous room appeared. Books from floor to ceiling. And in the middle of the room, there was a low table, cushions, manuscripts, and surgical instruments. He settled himself down at the table, and he began to read. Night after night, he returned to the library, poring over the medical books. The canon of Ibn Sina, El Mansour of El Razi, Al-Kitab al-Tasrif of al-Zahrawi and Hunayn ibn Ishaq's Beginner's Book of Bones. One night, he stopped, holding his breath. Was that the doctor coming? No. Just the wind calling or the old house talking. Night after night, day after day, little by little, the helper watched, listened, studied, and learned. As far as the doctor was concerned, yes, he was very satisfied. This, this, Helper was most useful. He could be a little tiresome at times. Wasn't very bright. <laughs> Sometimes the doctor had to give an instruction several times before it was understood. For example, the doctor liked to take a turmeric tea for his constitution every morning. But it had taken the helper two weeks to make it properly, balancing the infusion of turmeric, orange and honey. Of course, all of that was just a ruse by the young man to have the doctor believe that he was just a simpleton. But one day, everything changed. A patient came to the doctor, who was tormented by a centipede. It had, it had entered his heel, and it made its way towards his brain, and it was driving him half mad as it wriggled and nibbled and squirmed and slithered and scratched its way through the corridors of his mind, driving him into paroxysms of rage and terror and despair. <laughs> And the helper could hear him in the doctor's room, raging, screaming, shouting at the doctor. In other days, he was just silent and morose. The doctor decided he must operate immediately to remove the centipede. And he ordered that the hemen be rented privately for the operation. He needed heat to operate successfully. The helper was eager to watch the operation, but the doctor wouldn't allow anyone to be present. So, on the day of the operation, the helper stole into the hemen and he climbed up into the roof onto a wide beam. It was dark in the roof because the hammam was lit by low-hanging lanterns. Up there, in the darkness of the rafters, he could see everything that was going on in the room below. The door opened. The doctor and the patient entered. The door closed. The patient 
lay down and the doctor had him inhale a soporific concoction. In the somnolence of the steamy heat, he was soon asleep. All was quiet, just the occasional drip, drip of condensation echoing about the bars. The doctor quickly lit several lanterns. Then he took a scalpel and his work began. Cut, a slice, blood oozed, the skin peeled back. He took a saw and he carved into the cranium. The piece of bone removed and the gelatous brain appeared. And there, among the fragile folds, was the centipede. The helper was holding his breath, consumed by what he saw. The doctor took a pair of tweezers and went to try and catch the centipede. But it was too fast. It slipped away from the tweezers. This way, that way, this way, that way, a hundred hurrying little legs and slimy segments on the run. The helper was beside himself with frustration, willing the doctor to succeed. Again and again, the doctor tried but couldn't catch it. Suddenly, the helper remembered catching insects as a child. And before he could stop himself, he cried out, Master, heat the tweezers. You won't catch the insect when the tweezers are caught. The doctor stopped. He didn't look up. He just stopped. The tweezers hovering over the brain. Then he heated the tweezers in the flame. He went again to catch the centipede, caught it, and it was gone. The cranium returned tiny bolts in place, the skin stitched, dressed. The job was done. And only then did the doctor look up. The two men stared at one another in the silence and then the doctor left the room. In the days that followed, everything seemed to continue as normal. Of course, the helper made no more pretense of being deaf and dumb. The doctor gave instructions. The helper carried them out. And every day, the helper prepared the doctor's turmeric tea. But now, most of what was spoken between them was spoken through their eyes. Sometimes, when his back was turned, the helper could feel the doctor's eyes searing into him. And the doctor said with his eyes, So, you deceived me. Had me believe that you were just a simpleton, so you could steal my knowledge, my power, my wealth. And the helper said with a look, So what will you do? What will you do with me, Doctor? And the Doctor was thinking, I can't send you away. You know too much. And the Helper thought, You won't send me away. I know too much. So what will you do? What will you do with me, Doctor? His eyes flicked around the apothecary, rows and rows of little bottles. Headlock. Poison. The helper began preparing antidotes to poison. He knew from his studies that some poisons could work as antidotes to others.
Where's the hemlock? It was there yesterday. Why is the doctor using hemlock? He went home and said to his mother, Mother, if I return home one day in terrible pain, wrap me in this cotton sheet, place me in this jar with the antidote I've prepared, and feed me this milk with a remedy through a straw. One day, the doctor and the helper were alone in the apothecary, when suddenly the helper began... <coughs> 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 he felt his body flush with fever, and then he was gasping for breath. He looked at the doctor, but the doctor made no move to help him. He just stared, and then he started to smile. <gasps> and the helper stumbled towards the door. He had no idea how he had been poisoned. He just knew that he had to get home. And somehow, stumbling, gasping, rasping for a breath, he made it home. As soon as he did, his mother wrapped him in the cotton. She placed him in the vat and began to feed him the milk through the straw. And so he remained in quarantine. Forty days cocooned in isolation. His mother sat beside him, praying, reciting liquor and Quran. Ya Shafi, Ya Wafi, Ya Shafi, Ya Wafi. The solution in the vat turned rank. But at last, all the toxins left the young man's body and he was restored to good health. Now, you may well think that a stiff dose of poisoning would deter the young man from returning to the doctor. But he was determined to finish his studies and save the people of his town. And so, he returned to the doctor's house, reciting invocations as he went. أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. When the doctor saw the helper walk into the apothecary, perfectly alive and well, he nearly fell backwards with shock. The young man smiled. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. I'm sorry I've been away so long. I haven't been well. And he went back to work. From that moment, the doctor knew no peace. His mind was harangued with a tirade of questions. Does he know I tried to poison him? He must do. He must have prepared an antidote. God, he knows so much. What am I going to do? Shall I dismiss him? But if I do, he might take revenge, have me brought to justice. What if he takes his own justice? What am I going to do? If he makes me a cup of turmeric tea, shall I drink it? But if I refuse, it will show I'm suspicious. It will be an admission of guilt. What am I going to do? The young man did indeed serve the doctor his turmeric tea. But the doctor watched him like a hawk as he prepared it. And he insisted that the young man join him in a cup, the two men stared at one another over the rim as they both took the first sip. But the tea didn't poison the doctor. But with every passing day, his fears grew stronger. He became obsessed, thinking about ways that the doctor, that the helper might try to poison him. It could be in the ink. It could be in the books. It could be on every surface that he touched be in the air. Yeah, yes, because the young man might have an immunity so they could be breathing the same air and only he would be affected. It never occurred to him to seek redemption, to beg forgiveness, to share his knowledge with the helper. He remained stubbornly determined to hold on to his position of grandeur as the only doctor in the town. 
But now, when people ran to him to kiss his hand, he withdrew a haunted look in his eyes. Constant fear of being poisoned ate away at him. The exhaustion just lingered in his bones. And he became forgetful. He couldn't remember. What appointments do I have today? Where, where are my notes? Where are my surgical... It Where's the key? Where's the key to the library? He became more and more dependent on the helper. Here it is, Doctor, where it always is. One morning, the Doctor was going to have an appointment with an important patient, a wealthy merchant who had connections with the Sultan, no less, was passing through the town and had asked to see him. The Doctor was very keen to impress him. But that morning, the doctor was too agitated to think straight. The night before, he had gone into his study and he had found a book open on a page. Had he left the book there? Or the helper? It was open on a page describing Jabir ibn Khayyan's discovery of white arsenic, odorless, colorless, in powder solution or gaseous form. He hadn't slept a wink that night. But he had to get himself together. He had to be ready for this patient. He was so agitated, he didn't notice when the helper entered the room and handed him his cup of turmeric tea. He just took the cup, he lifted it to his lips and he took a sip. And he stopped. The helper had left the room. The helper wasn't drinking with him. He hadn't seen the helper prepare the tea. That morning, the doctor took one sip of turmeric tea and the doctor fell down, dead. That morning, the helper had gone into the kitchen to prepare the doctor's turmeric tea as usual, ground turmeric, a grating of ginger, cardamom, orange zest and honey. Not too much. Doctor doesn't like it that way. For the helper, the doctor's death was a tragedy. Such a waste of knowledge. He had hoped that one day the doctor would redeem himself, free himself from all his fears and seek the remedy to the real toxin that afflicted him. But this story ends with hope. The young man completed his studies and with generosity and humility, he became a fine doctor and saved the people of his town.